good afternoon all. Um, hope you have a fantastic lunch and get together uh, here in the venue. And a warm welcome back to the audience online as well. Thanks very much for keeping up with us, sorry. <laughs> up with us. Uh, it is not easy to be um, in front of the computer so many hours, so thank you. Uh, so uh, to warm up a little bit, let's put a bit of, of context to the, to the topic. As we all know, there is a high in the interdependence between human, animals, and environment. Therefore, the way to treat and prevent um, infections in all of them should be considered through a holi holistic approach. The misuse of antimicrobials uh, and its release to the environment leads to an increase in antimicrobial resistance that we need to, to counteract. So, the efforts against antimicrobial resistance do not start here. This journey started back in January 1 and uh, uh, years ago as well, as most of you already know. And as a result today, we have common objectives for this project. Provide support in the update of national action plans already in place, as well as help the new ones uh, in the development and uh, work on the strengthening the response and coordination of health systems uh, with the aim of protecting uh, the people in Europe and also making uh, Europe a, re a region in best practice. Uh, to go more specific, in the um, antimicrobial stewardship group, uh, they will identify and define core elements and develop competencies for both AMS and uh, inspection, prevention and uh, control groups in human, animals and environment. And uh, while in the area of access, we'll support the common objectives, providing an improvement of availability um, for products needed in human and veterinary side. So uh, back in the January 1, it, it had been identified that there was a need of harmonization of the stewardship approach in the region across the three domains. Uh, and a strong demand for sharing and exchange expertise in both veterinary and, uh, and human field, and for the environment. <laughs> the former joint action proved that a harmonized stewardship approach unifying all sectors was necessary. One of the innovations of the new joint action is the stewardship in the environment as a One Health approach aims to sustainably balance and optimize the health of people, animals, and ecosystems. A coherent and coordinated set of actions is planned to provide training and mentorship to key professionals on the impact of stewardship programs on environmental contamination that is linked to antimicrobial resistance. However, even in the present, the presence of the most advanced and complete stewardship programs, failure may happen. It has been shown that targeted behavioral change strategies are needed to increase the success of any intervention. So uh, in order to fill those gaps in the human domain, we will create a common framework where all the member states will find uh, the core competencies and elements needed to develop their programs. Uh, and we will also provide a toolkit for self-context uh, assessment. To facilitate the exchange of knowledge and the field, uh, at the field level, we will build a platform where the mentorship and observership programs will be allocated. And uh, we will create an expert network formed by professionals working in the front line of our healthcare systems. For the veterinary, the, the veterinary side, uh, through working together, we will define the core elements which will allow us to establish guidelines, both in food production animals and companion animals, for the development and implementation of the stewardship programs. The identified core competencies and knowledge will be shared and developed with an expert network supported by training programs such as peer-to-peer uh, -peer or training in stays. In the process of developing a stewardship program in the environment, we first need to define our target groups and relevant stakeholders at national and EU level, apart from human and veterinary healthcare professionals. To develop an effective training and awareness toolkit, it is important to first investigate our target group's needs. 
This involves assessing their current understanding and knowledge on antimicrobial resistance and their awareness on the strategies of how to minimize the emission and diffusion of antimicrobial resistance into the environment. We also need to identify how to evaluate the impact of such a toolkit on our group's awareness on AMR. After reviewing existing and available training materials and EU guidelines related to stewardship training programs, we will adapt the material accordingly. We will design and develop a training and awareness toolkit aimed at different target groups. Different adult education methodologies and innovative uh, learning will be explored and training of the trainers' courses will be conducted. Finally, the developed toolkit will be piloted at national level and post-training evaluation will help to assess the practicality of this toolkit, the uptake of the material by the key professionals, and also will show us any necessary changes for future improvement. Once finalized, all training materials are going to be translated into at least three national languages. The development of any antimicrobial stewardship program alone is not enough to battle AMR. Even the presence of the most complete stewardship programs and high-end diagnostic tools, failure to adhere to antimicrobial stewardship initiatives may occur if we don't consider the human factor. We will identify existing guidelines and analyze behavioral change models and explore behavioral factors that have been used in previous stewardship initiatives. After the analysis, we will propose the most appropriate behavioral change models, frameworks, and theories towards antimicrobial stewardship. This will become the basis for providing core elements and designing a behaviorally driven implementation toolkit towards stewardship's best practices. The most appropriate behavioral change techniques will be selected and piloted. An online, scalable educational and training program will aim to enable healthcare professionals to incorporate the behavioral change approach that is needed and expected prior to the development of any stewardship intervention. So to achieve this challenge, we need the professionals in the front line of our healthcare systems to feel empowered by a common framework where everybody can recognize their expertise and authority in the subject. The journey of knowledge is never ending, so to build capacities and exchange experiences for the professionals to excel in their daily basis tasks is a pillar of this project. And all these efforts will be useless if we don't make sure there is a sustainability in time. For that reason, we need to maintain alive the, spec the expert networks uh, over the time. One Health is an integrated, a unifying approach. This approach takes into consideration the complex interactions between humans, animals, and ecosystems. To drive the One Health change, we need to work together with common frameworks, standards, and mechanisms. Great, wonderful event. So now, we've talked about all of this stewardship, and stewardship is so important, and why is that? Because antibiotics are lifesavers. And I know I'm speaking to the choir here, so please don't sing, but this, I think we need to go back to the fundamentals now and again and be reminded. This is uh, evidence from 1964. It shows uh, different uh, bacterial pneumonias, the red line are those that were treated with penicillin, black line untreated. Antibiotic, it's survi uh, percentage survival rate. Antibiotics are lifesavers. Uh, let's hopefully I, nope. So, stewardship requires that antibiotics are available. Antibiotics, uh, the right antibiotic for the right dose, for the right duration at the right time has to be available not only to treat patients, but also minimize transmission. I know this is basic. This is, you all know this, uh, but I think it's good to repeat it now and then. But the right antibiotics are not always available. Maybe they're not available because they're in shortage. There's a market withdrawal. They were never marketed, or maybe they don't even exist yet, right? Um, so we have this great slide from France. So thank you so much to, from, to France for letting me use this. 
Um, this is lack of availability of veterinary antibiotics in France from a study that they did uh, and presented at the beginning of last year. Now, um, we all know that our European veterinarians are the superstars of fighting antibiotic resistance, right? 50% reduction in sales over the last decade. I mean, that's just phenomenal. But look what they got in exchange for that. In exchange for stewarding this, uh, they had record numbers of antibiotics in shortage. If you look at this, the main reason for withdrawing a product from the market are decreasing volumes, prices, and margins. Because the volumes decreased, the company said, it's not profitable anymore, we're gonna take away the products. They didn't, then that means that the right antibiotic is not available at the right time for these veterinarians. So looking at a Norwegian example, so if you think back to winter 2022, 2023, we, we'd come out of COVID and suddenly all of these childhood respiratory infections were coming up. Suddenly there were shortages. And so the Norwegian Center for Primary Care for Antibiotics, they said, okay, we, our first line antibiotic, which is penicillin V, phenoxymethyl penicillin, um, is the, it's the most used antibiotic in Norway, Sweden, Denmark it was in shortage. And they wanted to go out and give guidance to primary care physicians when they couldn't get a hold of phenoxymethyl penicillin. So they created this guidance. And they said, first, if the child has a, you know, not a very serious infection, maybe he or she doesn't need an antibiotic, first thing. Second is maybe you can crush up some uh, adult phenoxymethyl penicillin and administer it in food. If you can't get that, then go for oral suspension amoxicillin. If not, ce uh, cephalexine, erythromycin, sulfatrim, amoxiclav, and clindamycin. So they said, this is the order, you know, try to follow this if you can. And you see the tendency here, that it goes from narrow to broad to broader. So when the right antibiotic is not available, broader spectrum antibiotics are used in Europe. We know that more people die globally from lack of access to antibiotics than from resistance. So we're in a very fortunate situation in Europe that our children are actually treated and we have access to them. So they, uh, but in this case, it's going from narrow to broad to broader. And this is the impact. So this is what happened in Norway during this time. So if you look at the orange line, that's amoxiclav. That was the, next, the second to the last antibiotic that was recommended. And uh, the green is azithromycin. These are both oral suspension liquids. Um, and you see what happens is that azithromycin wasn't even on the list, by the way. Nobody recommended that. That was not desirable. Um, and, and so it doubled. It peaked when we don't have shortages. So the, or when we had a shortage, this is what happens. We went very, very broad. So what are we gonna do in Jamrai? So we were very fortunate uh, a couple of years back during the Slovenian presidency that we had the opportunity to come up with some interventions to improve access. So now we get to implement them and that's gonna be great fun and hopefully gonna have great impact. So here are some of the interventions. We can improve demand forecasting, we can do resilient supply, harmonization, innovative tendering practices, new reimbursement models, revenue guarantees, and much, much more. So just to look at a couple of these. Harmonization. So I'm gonna take the, the example of uh, phenoxymethyl penicillin again, um, penicillin V. Um, so Again, this is the most uh, used antibiotic in the Scandinavian countries. Apologies for all of the Scandinavian examples here, uh, but these are the ones that I live and breathe the, the most. I promise next time I talk to you, I will not focus so much time on Scandinavia. But in uh, Denmark and Norway, uh, we traditionally use tablets with the strength of 165 milligram, 330 milligram, 660 milligram, and one gram whereas Sweden uses 250 milligram, 500 milligram, 800 milligram, and one gram. Now, Norwegians and Swedes, we often think that we're quite different, don't we? So, especially when it comes to strapping skis on our foot and going cross-country skiing, or in the case of Sweden, on the football pitch. But really, when it comes to human health, 
We are not that different. And we are fragmenting an already small market by doing this. If we look at prescribing guidelines for standard of treatment of pneumonia in adults, so if you look at this, it's still phenoxymethyl penicillin. We're all using the same substance, but we're not using the same strength and the same dosing. That means we can't use the same package sizes. So all of this is about fragmentation. So these are, this is one of the, the uh, interventions we're going to look at. We're also going to look at innovative tendering. So Denmark, Iceland, and Norway uh, went together a couple years ago for pooled hospital tenders, where we said, you know what? we can't base our hospital tenders solely on price anymore because we don't have reliable supply. So we're gonna make t price only 25%. But instead, we're gonna, we're gonna focus on surety of supply and the environment and user preferences. And this is great because the environment, we already heard today from UNEP that uh, pharmaceutical production, uh, wastewater goes out into the environment and creates resistance pressure. So that's something that we definitely don't want to have happen. Um, so if we can give higher points to companies that, that show, demonstrate that they're not doing that, that's a benefit for AMR. But it's also a benefit for surety of supply. Because if you know where they're performing better, into the environment, if you know that they're not putting wastewater out in the local environment, you know where they're producing not only the finished product, but also the active pharmaceutical ingredient. So suddenly you have transparency into your supply chain, and you know if you're dependent upon a sole provider or one geographic reason, er, region. So, so this is a benefit. So it's like win, 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 right? The environment's better. Um, we get more stable supply, and we can diversify our supply chain. So our mandate was to give you a taste of what we're doing here in EU Jamrai. So this has been a taste of the national and multinational interventions that we're going to use to strengthen access to those antibiotics that countries themselves that participate in Jamrai will select. They are priority at-risk antibiotics and other AMR-related products, can be vaccines, can be diagnostics. If you want to know more, please come talk to me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. What a super interesting, energetic presentation. Thank you, thank you very much. Even I understood. <laughs> so, uh, so here we go, first Q&A. Uh, do we have some questions in the room? We also, I also have some here. Um, and of course, online audience, please do send in your questions. You're going to have four times round, plus a final round of Q&A. So this is super interactive this afternoon, so go for it. Um, and so any, any questions from the room, or shall we start with one of... don't see any hands raised. Okay, think about it for a minute. We have... do we have a hand? Yes, we have one over there. Okay. Hi. Um, my name is William Fitzgerald, I'm a veterinarian from Ireland. Um, just very briefly, my, this your slide there in relation to reducing 50% reduction in antimicrobials by veterinarians across Europe and its effects then on supply. How, in a perfect world, how would you go about resolving that? Well, I think in a, in a perfect world, what we have to do is we have to find out uh, which of the products uh, are critical um, that they've lost access to. So there's got to be some sort of prioritization, and that would be the, the country that would focus on that. And then we have to look at synergies across Europe. So, you know, are there, uh, is the market fragmented? Is, you know, are there small things that we can do? We're going to be talking to companies. Um, so we will be talking to the generic companies, uh, both uh, um, uh, animal and human. Um, so we're, we're quite creative. Um, I don't have all the answers now, but honestly, we're going to take a really flexible approach. We're going to really push on some of the national, um, uh, to make sure that we have strong national synergies so that we get the national actors to talk to with each other as well and try to get your um, European counterparts to be talking to each other. Um, but we're, you know, we're looking for solutions um, and we're going to try anything that we can that seems like a reasonable choice. Thank you very much, Christine. Would you like to add anything? 
Um, so, do we have any questions from the audience? I wasn't sure. I have a question. Yes? Sorry. Sorry, go ahead, please. Yeah, th thank you very much. Um, I, and I will comment only on human health. At ECDC, we'd be happy to collaborate, work with you. I showed data on the number of DDDs, defined daily doses of the new antibiotics, the old antibiotics. I showed data on incidence. All this will be available not only for the EU as a whole, but by country and over time. So if, if, you, if you need this to estimate the, the demand, then, then we'll be happy to work with you. We need it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have a question here. How is EU Jamari aligned with ongoing efforts to improve access to antibiotics? Who would like to take this one? Uh, so there's a lot going on right now in the access world, and we're, we're pretty lucky about that. But of course, there's a lot going on in, in AMR this year, right, with UNGA and everything coming. Um, but we, we're already in contact with the Joint Action on Shortages, Chessman. So um, hopefully many of your countries are involved in that, um, but we're going to align with them. They've been operational for a year. So they're focused on all medicines, but they should have some learnings uh, for antibiotics as well. So we're working on that. Uh, of course, we're working, we want to work with ECDC, we, we're working with EMA, um, we're working with HERA. Um, so we are really reaching out um, and trying to, uh, we've got presentations, uh, we already talked to WOA as well. Um, so um, everyone that we, we can think of to talk to, uh, we are definitely trying to talk to and be inclusive. Thank you, Christine. So if, if I don't see you, just yell, <laughs> okay, because <laughs> it's not necessarily, okay. So and we actually have one here about new technologies. What will EU Jamrai do to, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> to improve, she want to speak anymore. you don't want to, you want to speak anymore, <laughs> fine, that's absolutely fine. Well, what will you, um, so what will EU Jamrai to do to improve access to new technologies? Okay. Um. <laughs> Christine, you're just holding the floor. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I, I, know, I know there's a stewardship question in there as well. I'm par apologies. Uh, so um, we are working with HERA. Um, as many of you may be aware that HERA is in the process of um, designing a revenue guarantee for Europe. Um, this is to secure access to new antibiotics across all European countries. And this is such an important process because what it will do is it will have... Um, a guaranteed delivery time frame is the, is the anticipation so that if a hospital orders a new antibiotic, it should be delivered within 24 hours. Um, and these new antibiotics, as you know, they're slow to get to many markets. Um, so we're actively working with HERA on the implementation of this. So if you want to know more about this HERA scheme, please come talk to me about that as well. Okay, thank you very much. Indeed, question on stewardship. No hands up. Okay, just wanted to double check. And of course, you, you guys let me know if you have some questions that are coming in. Um, so, one of the major takeaways from EU Jamrai 1 was the importance of enhancing collaboration between the different working groups. What are you guys doing this time around to avoid working in silos? There, there was a lot of question about this this morning as well. Yes. Martha. Yes, basically, um, well, the concept of One Health it's not, it's not only uh, it stands for um, human, animal, and environment uh, all interconnected. It's, all, it's also how we um, uh, counteract uh, against a AMR as well. So, uh, for instance, a AMS uh, will have to work uh, in close contact with, uh, uh, with uh, prevention. Then surveillance uh, need to give the data to these two, these two other groups. To, to work in a better way. Uh, also, access need, need to give the tools to AMR, a AMS, sorry, and IPC. So, and then communication needs to help all of us to uh, uh, have access to the public. So at the end, all of us need to work in all together. If not, uh, this, this won't work. But concretely, I mean, I want to add to this. So concretely, how do you, can you maybe have, give me an example on how you can see this happening on the ground? Well, basically, I mean, um, you cannot work without tools. Mm. 
anti antibiotics, the access is, is very important, then you cannot work blinded without data, so surveillance need, need to be there for you. And, uh, and uh, the rest, the communication, how we do the framework and, and, and everything will give uh, the, the also tools to the people that is in the ground to really um, be empower, empowered to, to, to work and to, to be the, the, the front line of, of the AMR. So how we do that? We will see in four years as well. Do you have anything to add, perhaps? Well, actually, actually I want to say that uh, bacteria do not know uh, boundaries, and they all work together at some point, and uh, this is why we also need to address the formation of biofilms. And uh, if bacteria don't work alone and in silos, then we shouldn't either if we want to battle AMR. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Any hands raised in the room? Does anybody have a good question? <laughs> <laughs> Do I, did I see your hand raised over there? No, I thought I did. Okay. Um, okay, so. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Ah, oh, it's working. <laughs> so, what's the main innovation in EU Jamrai 2 compared to EU Jamrai 1? Again, question on stewardship. Well, uh, as stated, the major innovation is the stewardship in the environment. Uh, one of the Jamrai's one outcomes was that a, a unifying approach uh, for all sectors was necessary. We cannot have a One Health approach if we omit the environment. So we, it's brand new, the stewardship in the environment, of course, and we have to reach out to many target groups and many stakeholders. We're not looking at healthcare, uh, human healthcare professionals or veterinarians alone. We have to be more inclusive, and this includes working uh, workers in farms, and uh, including aquaculture, and we have to consider those working in slaughterhouses because their practices and their hand hygiene standards would uh, emit or uh, diffuse uh, resistance genes into the food chain. We need to talk about uh, ac ac academics and uh, researchers because their work is going to provide evidence for the evidence-based decisions that need to be uh, taken. And we have to uh, talk and include uh, regulatory bo uh, bodies because these are the ones that are going to implement and enforce into regulations and national action plans which have to be uh, updated uh, during Jamrai 2. And we also have to talk to communities and to customers and to NGOs because they are going to help us raise awareness towards stewardship the need of stewardship into the environment. And we, of course, need to include uh, wastewater uh, treatment managers because they are the ones that are going to prevent the emission of resistance genes into the water supply and so on. So we have to include everyone if we uh, are going to have a, one, a real One Health approach. Thank you very I guess much, I would Gita. just add yeah. on yes, for please. what we're doing in access, the, the real difference between EU Jamrai 1 and 2 is that we're trying to be very concrete. This is about really improving access of select products. So if, um, so we want each country to really choose less than 10 substances or uh, a vaccine or diagnostic and we are going to really work to improve access to that in a concrete basis. Um, and that, that, that could be, you know, we're, we're looking at both demand and supply side. So if there's a product that, that primary care physicians no longer prescribe because it's often in shortage and they don't dare to do that, then we need to understand that barrier. But we're gonna do that for, for each country. Um, so to look and see what are the barriers in country um, and how can we design solutions to improve, um, in, to improve access for that product? In a very concrete way. Mm. Thank you very much, Christine. Danilo. You know, I was not just scratching my, <laughs> my chin. <laughs> no, um, thank you very much, and, and I completely agree that the, the concept of stewardship should be much broader and involve many other partners that we haven't talked to. But one that you didn't mention, and one thing that we are working on right now is we're developing a, a, a training course for leadership for stewardship. 
Because I think there's many stewardship programs that in theory we know what to do, but without the buy-in from, from higher management and the understanding of what it can do in the, in the facility, uh, it's not going to happen or it's not going to sustain itself. <clears throat> so just something that maybe also we could, we could uh, explore and expand through EU Gemri is, uh, is to work on leadership for stewardship. Thank you. Any thoughts on that? Nida? Uh, first of all, it's just brand new. It has never been done before, so we're setting the basis for future improvement and development. So, of course, we are going to raise, first of all, awareness, and uh, we are going to uh, assess their knowledge on everything. So, once we uh, see where they stand and where we want to go, we're going to fill in the gaps of everything and uh, we are going to be improving everything and training and education of course is uh, the first steps towards leadership so we're going to address those first and then move on and of course there are many other programs out there that might have the same uh, goals and outputs so we have to be very careful so as to not overlap so joint action does not all only include jam right do it includes you as well Thank you so much. Yes, please, Javier. Uh, yes, thank you. I heard the word behavioral change and starting from the principle that the biggest problem in antimicrobial resistance is the natural resistance of humans to change. <laughs> I would like to know uh, which, if you have already defined a plan with targeted or priorities uh, ac actions on behavioral change, if this is across the sectors, and uh, the most uh, important question for me is, do you already have uh, monitoring or key performance indicators? How do you know that your interventions are changing the behavior? I would be very pleased to know that because right, we would like to apply that worldwide. <laughs> Thank you. the jam right too. Uh, so uh, we are not going to use the Isla Yat uh, principle. It seems like a good uh, idea at the time. We're going to use the COMB model, which is supposed to be, uh, according to research, the most complete one. We're going to address capability, motivation, and opportunity. And uh, the prescribing and the antimicrobial overuse is a behavior. So we have to take action on that behavior. And in order to do that, we need need to know who needs to do what differently, to whom and how often. So we are going to first address all the literature and review it and we are going to come up to the best plan and pilot it. So uh, it's going to involve perhaps questionnaires and stru structured uh, discussions or even observations because we need to know why people behave as they behave. Perhaps they didn't have the opportunity or perhaps they don't have the capability or perhaps they don't have an alternative. When we address all those, then we are going to put the framework for the behavioral change. The first thing is that we want to make them want to change. So we need to know all the things that we didn't know we didn't know. It's more of a qualitative research. So in the access part for behavioral change, it will be targeted to the antibiotics that have been selected. So if, for example, if a country chooses uh, pediatric amoxicillin, a behavioral change item would be to reach out to the primary care physicians if they're prescribing a lot of amoxiclav pediatric. You know, to understand why is that, that, that you're selecting amoxiclav? Are you worried about resistance? Or is it accessibility? Um, I think amoxicillin tastes pretty, pretty good, but I haven't tasted it myself. But, you know, is it dosing? Um, these types of things. So we're going to go specifically to the primary care physicians to understand uh, the behavior. And that would be the same on the veterinary. Sorry, I don't have a, a, a great example on the veterinary side. Hopefully I will next time. Um, but that's, we'll be going directly to the prescriber to understand their behaviors and what's influencing that choice for the specific product. Yeah, we yeah. have a question from Dominique. Uh, obviously, the countries are different. They have different cultures, they have different behaviors. Do you plan to address each country separately? Because I suppose that they will, yeah, they will need different solutions. In access, we do. But we're, uh, we have a smaller uh, group of countries that have, uh, are, are partaking in the access group. Yes, please. Uh, you were talking about training and uh, awareness, very important. It starts from this uh, 
point, uh, have you the, uh, the plan to contact WHO Academy based in Lyon, uh, which will open its door in October 2000, uh, this year, 2024, to see what you could bring uh, in the uh, training uh, offer of the WHO Academy, for instance, on these topics, um, targeting uh, countries from the south, but not only from the south, yeah. That was for specific products, Jerome, or was it, uh, is it, is it stewardship in general? Stewardship in general and sensitization to uh, good practices in the field of IML. But uh, they will need also your expertise for training the future uh, healthcare workers and generation, but also the, the broader public. Yeah, I, I believe so. We can collaborate. We are here to do that, right? <laughs> You mentioned also wastewater, and there is a big conference in Paris uh, in uh, March on uh, wastewater surveillance. And what could we do uh, in that field reg regarding uh, surveillance, uh, wastewater surveillance, and IMR? In surveillance, yes. And sorry to say, we, we have two more questions to go, and we're running out of time. So I'll, I'll please answer in a nutshell. Um, I think we should save that for the surveillance group. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. We will, we will get back to you. Uh -huh. So we have a question over here and one from Fraser, and that will be it. Can I still ask a question? Yes, please. Thanks. My name is Christine Pierce. I'm uh, representing the biopharmaceutical industry in Europe, uh, FPA. Um, so thank you, Christine, uh, for, for taking up the charge and you know, trying to find the concrete solutions for access. Uh, really, really happy to see that, and we're really grateful that something is happening there. Now, as you know better than any of us, um, the access is, of course, in the hands of, of the member states or the payers. So, are we are we sure? Um, is 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 this going to happen? Are they all signing up to it? Um, so, how how do you see this happening? Thank you. Uh, so we have 13, um, 13 member states that have signed up to the access work package, and I'm always trying to attract more. So if there's any of you that's sitting there that are now enticed, please uh, let me know. Um, but I think we have to look at, we, we're, we're going to be looking at solutions on both sides. So th some things might cost more, but hopefully we're also looking at solutions that can save producers money in order to improve access. So, you know, we want to talk to the EMA about um, packaging leaflets and these types of things as well. Of course, we need to be careful because many of these are primary care medicines and patients need to know how to take their medicines. Um, but we were also, you know, looking at, at product harmonization um, can also be a savings on, on behalf of a company. Um, so I, I've talked too long now, I guess. <laughs> Thank you very much, Christine. Well, Fraser, we'll take your question. Okay, yes, it's, it's, it's very short. It's just, uh, uh, my name's Fraser Goodwin, I'm with the European Public Health Alliance. And um, it's uh, noticeable that the subset of countries that you're uh, working with and engaged heavily is not the same as the subset of countries that have the highest levels of uh, prescription. So uh, my, my question immediately back to you is, how are you going to roll out the, the results in your learnings to the countries where the impact is possibly going to be potentially the greatest. Yeah. So um, we've committed to writing, uh, to documenting our processes and what we're going through for at least five countries. Um, and hopefully that will be on such a, 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 you know, not overly descriptive, but descriptive enough to share the process. And at the same time, we have a kickoff meeting for our work package in two weeks in Brussels. Everyone is welcome. So if anybody wants to uh, participate, uh, hybrid, um, unfortunately, sorry, the registration for participating in person in Brussels is closed, but uh, you're welcome to join us online. So any country that's interested. Thank you. A huge thank you to you, ladies. Thank you so much. And you'll be back uh, for the final Q&A yeah. at the end. But for now, I'm gonna thank you very much. Let's give them a big round of applause. Thank you.